Okay, well, good to be here again this morning and sharing with you from Judges chapter 9. Judges chapter 9, and we're going to read from verse 27 and down to verse 41, although we may cover more. There's a lot of narrative of battles and fighting going on. And kind of as a title, I want to just simply call this the burning bramble, the burning bramble, because the, the, the parable of Jotham is about to be fulfilled And so as we read from verse 29, just bear that in mind. And so it says in verse, uh, uh, sorry, chapter 9, verse 27, it says, They went out into the fields and gathered their vineyards and trod the grapes and made merry and went into the house of their God and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. And Gael, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech and who is Shechem? that we should serve him. Is not he the son of Jerobal and Zebul, his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem, but why should we serve him? And would to God this people were under my hand, then would I remove Abimelech. And he said to Abimelech, increase thine army and come out. And then Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gael, the son of Ebed. His anger was kindled, and he sent messengers unto Abimelech privily, saying, Behold, Gael, the son of Ebed, and his brethren, be come to Shechem, and behold, they fortify the city against thee. Now, therefore, up by night, thou and thy people that is with thee, and lie in wait in the field. And it shall be that in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, Thou shalt rise early and set up the city, and behold, when he and the people that is with him come out against thee, then mayest thou do to them as thou shalt find occasion. And Abimelech rose up and all the people that were with him by night, and they laid wait against Shechem in four companies. And Gael, the son of Ebed, went out and stood in the entering of the gate of the city. And Abimelech rose up and the people that were with him from lying in wait. And when Gael saw the people, he said to Zebul, Behold, there come people down from the top of the mountains. And Zebul said unto him, Thou seest the shadow of the mountains as if they were men. And Gael spake again and said, See, there come down people down by the middle of the land. And another company come along by the plain of uh, Mionnihim. Then said Zebul unto him, Where is now thy mouth, wherewith thou saidst, Who is Abimelech, that we should serve him? Is not this the people that thou hast despised? Go out, I pray now, and fight with them. And Gael went out before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him. And many were overthrown and wounded, even unto the entering of the gate. And Abimelech dwelt at Aruma, and Zebul thrust out Gael and his brethren, that they should not dwell in Shechem. Again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. And what we're seeing is uh, the this parable that Jotham had spoken uh, about fire coming out from Abimelech and then also coming from Shechem and the, just all the devastation that would occur is now actually taking place. And it all uh, begins basically in verse 27 at this uh, time of year uh, that should have been the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was uh, usually held in the uh, the September of the year, uh, one of the feasts of, of Jehovah, that they should have been coming together, uh, the last of the festivals for a time of unprecedented joy. But sadly, uh, the men of Shechem had turned their back on Jehovah, and they were now uh, worshiping Baal of the Covenant. And so it says they still had a, a kind of a festival time, uh, but it wasn't to the Lord, it was to Baal. And it says, they went out into the fields, verse 27, gathered their vineyards, because, of course, it was a harvest festival, and it was the wine harvest. And, of course, that is always the case uh, with the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, that it's a wine harvest. And so they brought in their wine. It says, they trod the grapes, and they made merry, and went to the house of their God, and did eat and drink, and cursed Abimelech. And so instead of being filled with joy, which is that 
festival. Uh, Tabernacles is uh, very much connected with joy. If you read Leviticus 23 and verses 34 through 39, you'll see that it was a time when Israel was supposed to rejoice before the Lord their God, because it was the final harvest of the year. And it was a time to look back uh, with thanksgiving and joy for Jehovah's wonderful provisions to the people in this land that he had given them. But now it had been turned into a time of drunken debauchery as they were worshiping Baal. And uh, in the heat of the drunkenness, uh, of course, people tend to uh, speak things that they wouldn't perhaps normally say uh, when they're sober. And of course, uh, dr drinking uh, excessively, uh, it does cause people to, to say offensive things and, and difficult things. And, and so it says, that while they were involved in all of this, it says that they cursed Abimelech. And remember, we said they were very fickle. They changed completely. They were, they were this, these are the same people that made him their king, that made him king over them. And now uh, they're disenchanted because we, we read earlier that God had sent an evil spirit between the men of Shechem and Abimelech. And so uh, they're now filled with suspicion. And this suspicion of Abimelech, they've already uh, begun a campaign to block the roads and hinder his, uh, his commerce. And now they just openly curse him. Uh, in their drunken stupor. And so it says they did eat and drink and they cursed Abimelech. In verse 28, it says, Gael, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is not he the son of Jerobal and Zebel, his officer, serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem? For why should we serve him? So now there's, a, uh, again, just a, somebody else stepping into the, the scene who, just the same as Abimelech, is a man filled with selfish ambition. Uh, notice verse 29, would, God, uh, would to God the people were under my hand. In other words, yeah, Abimelech's no good, but I'm the man to take control. I'm the man to lead. And so in the midst of all this selfish ambition, here comes another man filled with selfish ambition. And in order to encourage division, Gale deliberately uh, highlights Abimelech's links with his father. Remember when he had first uh, kind of presented himself, Abimelech, uh, he, he kind of played down his connection with his father and emphasized his collection, connection with his mother, uh, who was from Shechem. And was this concubine? Well, now Gael highlights his connection with his father, and especially the name Jerobal. And again, the one who basically opposed Baal. And now they're, of course, remember they're worshiping Baal. They're, they're all drunk. They're kind of involved in Baal worship up to their eyeballs. And, and so now he says, uh, why would we want to be connected with this man who was known for pulling down Baal's uh, idols and his groves, you see. So he's emphasizing that connection uh, and instead saying uh, in, we should really uh, be loyal uh, to Hamor, the father of Shechem. So uh, he highlights the heritage and descendants of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Now, we, we know this from back in Genesis 33. If we go back there and we'll see uh, what he's uh, appealing to here. Genesis 33 and verse 19, uh, we read, it, it says, And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. Of course, it's Abraham uh, buying a burial, or Jacob buying a burial ground uh, from Hamor. 34, chapter 34, and verse 2, again, and when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. And so it's, it's kind of uh, emphasizing their pagan origins, you know, they're, they're connected with this Hivite uh, called Hamor. Uh, we're not connected with these that would seek, uh, dare to, uh, to, to test Baal at all. So why would you be linked with one whose father opposed the worship of Baal? 
emphasizing Abimelech's connection, as, of course, the one who opposed Baal, Gideon, was the father uh, of Abimelech. And so he says in verse 29, and would to God this people were under my hand. So it's interesting how he's he's appealing to a kind of racial origins. You know, and the enemy loves to divide on any possible ground that he can. Uh, whether it's your ancestry, uh, background, or whatever. He loves to have us to be proud of our face, our race, or any of these things. He loves to emphasize those things, and that's what causes division uh, amongst God's people uh, instead of the, the unity that should be there. So, so again, he's kind of weighing this. He's tying in uh, this racial connections. And so it says in verse 29, and would to God this people were under my hand. And so, again, he, he once again, uh, a man with selfish ambition wants to replace a man with selfish ambition. And again, the, the, the whole stench of this chapter is one of selfish ambition. Let nothing, uh, the New Testament would say, be done through selfish ambition, through, through strife or vain glory. And that's all that we're seeing in this chapter. And, and so he begins to boast. He says, I would to God the people were under my hand. Then would I remove Abimelech? And he said to Abimelech, increase thine army and come out. And it's amazing how when people get drink in them, one of the things that tends to happen is they become very boastful and proud. And so here he's making this great boast. I, I'd take Abimelech out. And let him even increase his army. It won't make any difference. I'll still take him out. And again, it's just, it's drink speaking, and of course, it's drink uh, kind of inflaming the, the passions of the natural man, and the pride comes out, and of course, boastfulness, uh, boastful challenge. And of course, it's easy to do that when your enemy is miles away. It's easy to make those kind of threats when the enemy is nowhere in sight. And of course, that is the case. And we need to be very careful of boasting, unless we boast in the Lord. We can never do enough of that, but we need to be very careful about boasting in anything else other than the Lord. And let's just look at some of the examples in Scripture. And this is a good principle for all of us, is to, to, to daily make our boast in the Lord. Psalm 34, verse 2, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. Psalm 44 and verse 8, it says, In God we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever. Selah, think about that. And then in the New Testament, where in Corinth uh, they were boasting in their spiritual gifts. They were boasting in their, their allegiance to certain leaders. And one of the things that he says in chapter 1, verse 31, he says that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And then one more scripture that, again, is very pertinent to this idea of boasting and what our boasting should be in. Galatians 6 and verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. And so unlike Gail, who was boasting about things that he had, he had not done, not accomplished, he's just saying, I can take out Abimelech, he, let him increase his army. It's not a problem for me. I can do all these things. He's full of self-confidence. He's full of uh, inflated ego, and he's boasting in things that he hasn't done. He, he's not done these things at all, but he's full of boasting. And yet we would say, yes, we should boast, but not in ourselves, but in the Lord Jesus and in our God. And of course, we should, we should do that often. Verse 30, it's when Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gael, the son of Ebed, his anger was kindled. His anger was kindled. And of course, uh, although um, I guess treachery begets treachery, 
Uh, Zebo was insulted about being called the officer or superintendent of, of uh, Abimelech. And, and so he was offended by that. Look at verse 28 again, the end of verse 28. It says, Zebul is officer. Should we serve him? Is not this the son of Jerubal? And Zebul is officer. Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for why should we serve them? So although <clears throat> Abimelech was not living there, uh, he was still king over that area, even though they were in ferment and rebellion. And uh, the implication is that he had left behind him this man Zebul uh, to be the ruler of the city in his stead while he was absent. And so, of course, Zebul gets offended by this treachery. And so he begins to act in a treacherous way. He's insulted by being called the officer or superintendent of Abimelech. Perhaps it injured his pride. Uh, it seems like he was in charge of Shechem. And though, although made, uh, Abimelech made their king, uh, he didn't live there. And this man perhaps was acting on his behalf. And so perhaps again, here's another man who took that position because he was filled with ambition as well. And he liked the place that had been given him and was unwilling to give it up to this upstart called Gale. And so what does he do? Unlike Gale, this man is a man with a plan. Gale's just talk. It's just, that's all he is. He's just talk, but he's no plan, no, no clear direction. But Zebo has a definite plan. And so it says in verse 31, he sent messengers to Abimelech privately saying, behold, Gale, the son of Ebed and his brethren become to Shechem and behold, they fortify the city against thee. Now, therefore, up by night, thou and thy people with thee, and lie in wait in the field. And it shall be in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, thou shalt rise early, set upon the city. And behold, when he and the people that is with him come out against thee, then mayest thou do to them as thou shalt find occasion. Of course, this is a good time to attack, too, because remember, they're all... Uh, in a drunken stupor uh, in this harvest festival. And probably the next morning when they wake up, they would be a little worse for wear, uh, feeling the after effects of too much uh, wine. And uh, this would be a perfect occasion uh, to take them. And so we see that this plan is, is accepted. It's taken. Abimelech takes it seriously. And he does rise up by night. It says in verse 34, Abimelech rose up and all the people that were with him by night, and they laid way against Shechem in four companies. Uh, Gideon, remember, he had three companies. But this, as this man, Abimelech, the son of Gideon, has gone one further. He's four companies. And what he's doing is cutting off all means of escape. He's going to surround the city of Shechem so there's no way out. And so uh, he gets his men. They go through the night. They're there ready for battle. And the next morning, it says, Gael, the son of Ebed, went out and stood, in verse 35, in the entering of the gate of the city, and Abimelech rose up and the people that were with him from lying in wait. And when Gael saw the people, he said to Zebo, Behold, there come people down from the top of the mountains. And Zebo said unto him, Thou seest the shadow of the mountain as if they, thou sawest men. And so he just said, ah, that's you just seeing shadows. It's, you know, you're, you're worse from where from last night's drinking. And all you're seeing is the shadow of the mountain. You know, it's nothing to worry about. Verse 36, when Gail saw the people, he said to Zebul, they come down from the top of the mountain. Uh, verse 37, Gail spake again and said, see, they, they come people down by the middle of the land. Then another company come along by the plain of uh, Mer Meronahim. And so they're obviously coming from all these different directions now, and he's seeing it very, very clear, clearly. And this is where Gail uh, gets to, uh, in a sense, be challenged by Zebul. It says, Gail spake again. He saw all this. Verse 38, then said Zebul unto him, where is now thy mouth? And wherewith thou saidst, who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Is not this the people that thou hast despised? Go out, I pray now, and fight with them. We would say, put your money where your mouth is. In other words, you know, prove yourself now. Now is your opportunity. Uh, you made all these boasts. Uh, you know, even if he increases army, 
I've, I've got it. Uh, I can take him out. And so now his opportunity is, is given to him. And again, it's just a, a warning to us all, isn't it, to be careful about what we say. Because the Lord may put us to the test and say, okay, I heard what you said. Okay, prove it. Now's your opportunity. And so we need to be very careful about boasting, and especially about boasting about winning a battle before we fought the battle. And so this is what this man has done, and uh, he's now going to be put to the test. And fair play to the man, he went out. It says, and Gale went out, verse 39, before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. So at least he attempted to live up to his boast, but it didn't work out very well for him because it says Abimelech chased him and he fled before him and many were overthrown and wounded even to the entering of the gate. And so Abimelech still hasn't entered into the city of Shechem, but he has gone up to the gates and, of course, left devastation, many overthrown, many wounded in battle. But Abimelech is not done. Even though he's chased them back and killed a lot of them, wounded a lot of them, uh, he hasn't entered into the city, but he does have plans. And so it tells us in verse 42, now we're moving on to new territory, and we're going to really witness the, the sad ending of Abimelech in this section. And so it says, Abimelech dwelt in Aruma and Zebul thrust out Gael and his brethren, then they should not dwell in Shechem. And so the mopping up ref, uh, operations is left uh, to uh, this man, Zebul, who had been put in charge of the city, and he thrust out Gael and his brethren that they should not dwell in Shechem. But it says, it came to pass on the morrow that the people went out into the field and they told Abimelech, and he took the people and divided them into three companies and laid way in the field and looked and behold, the people were come forth out of the city and he rose up against them and smote them. So as, as they're thrust out of the city by Zebul, there is Abimelech waiting for them. And again, he destroys them. And so we, we see that this parable, if you look back to verse 15 uh, of chapter 9, uh, the parable of Jotham, and the bramble said unto the trees, if in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow, and if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. And we see this is exactly what's happening. The bramble is burning, and he's causing a, a lot of devastation to the men of Shechem because they once took him as ruler, but they had now rejected him, and now they're paying the price for rejecting this self-appointed ruler, and he does cause devastation. And just as an aside, I do think it's true that when a man is in a position of rule amongst God's people, but he's there because he's... He's a self-appointed man. He's not a man that the Holy Spirit has burdened for the work. He's not a man that's been raised up by the Holy Ghost. All he cares about is position and power. And woe betide anyone who threatens that position in that power base, and they will suffer the consequences of daring to challenge this Diotrephes individual. We see it in 3 John. Uh, he, he rails against them. Uh, he, he deals terribly with them because he doesn't care about the flock. All he cares about is that preeminent place. And we see that with Abimelech, and we see that with all these self-appointed type men, uh, they really don't care for the flock. All they care about is their place and their power, and woe betide anyone that dare challenge or seek uh, to question uh, their authority, and there'll be consequences. Notice as well in verse 20 of our chapter, it says, but if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. So again, what's what we're just seeing, we're seeing that actually Jotham's parable really was coming true, that fire's burning in every direction here. And there's a lot of loss and a lot of devastation. And again, we, we, we're going to see in the New Testament, Paul would say to the Galatians, watch out unless you bite and devour one another. And isn't it a terrible thing 
when God's people are laying waste to one another and the enemy is just laughing us to scorn. The real enemy loves it when we're fighting it with each other because we're leaving him alone. And here's supposedly the people of God and they're tearing one another to pieces. And so there's great application, great things to learn from this uh, for ourselves. But notice in uh, just as we move on in this section, verse 44, uh, it says, and Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood in the entering of the gate of the city. And the two of the other companies ran upon all the people that were in the fields and slew them. So again, there's a tremendous slaughter. And then it says, and Abimelech fought against the city all that day. And he took the city and slew the people that was therein and beat down the city and sowed it with salt. So Shechem is totally devastate, totally wasted, destroyed. And of course, this idea of sowing it with salt was a symbolic act that condemned Shechem to desolation for years to come. And again, I want you just to see where this phrase is found in the word of God. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 29, Deuteronomy 29, where it always talks about uh, kind of a place being a wilderness, being devastated. At Deuteronomy 29, verse 23, and the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt in burning, that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. So here again, we've got it's not sown because it's a land of brimstone and salt. It's just useless. Uh, sowing it with salt makes the land unproductive, makes it barren, makes it a wasteland. And that's what second Shechem became. Psalm 107 and verse 34. Again, same concept. Psalm 107, verse 34, it says, <clears throat> Let's see, I'm looking at Psalm 106, that's why it doesn't look right. It says, verse 34, a fruitful land unto barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. He turns the rivers into a wilderness, the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. And certainly that was true concerning Shechem and the wicked, ambitious men that lived there. Jeremiah 17 and verse 6, again, the same concept. It says, for he shall be like a heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabit it. Now, who is it that's going to do that? Look at verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Well, what a description of the men of Shechem. Their hearts departed from the Lord. They were worshiping Baal Bereth, and they trusted in man. Abimelech first, and then after that, uh, they trusted in Gael. And, and, and you see the result of it. Uh, he shall be like the heath in the desert. He shall not see when good cometh. He shall be an inhabit the parched place in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. And so that is exactly what took place. And in fact, Shechem would not be built again until the days of Jeroboam uh, <clears throat> the first in first Kings 12 is when we see uh, that Shechem was built again by this man, Jeroboam. So let's just look there in 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 25, the rebuilding of Shechem and another place that had been destroyed in our very passages that we've considered Penwell. Chapter 12, verse 25, then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penwell. So, Long, uh, long time, uh, this land would lay a land covered with salt until uh, uh, over a century later, it would be uh, built by Jeroboam. So back in our passage, Judges and verse 46 now, Judges 9 and verse 46, we read what happens next in this uh, kind of fast-paced adventure uh, and uh, 
conflict that is taking place. It says, and when all the men of the tower of Shechem heard that, heard about this devastation and the destruction of the city and all the rest of it, it says, and when all the men of the tower of Shechem heard that, they entered into the hold of the house of the god Bereth. That's the same as Baal Bereth, right? So the Baal of the covenant. And so basically they go into the house of their god, uh, no doubt into a tower to be protected and preserved from the devastation of the bramble fire uh, caused by Abimelech. But their God was powerless to protect them from Abimelech's fury. Uh, and it was very ironic that they're hiding in the very place which they had cursed Abimelech a short while before. If you look back to verse 27, it says they went out into the fields and gathered their vineyards and trod the grapes and made merry and went into the house of their God and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. So the very place where they'd, they'd cursed Abimelech, now they're back in that place and they're about to feel the fiery burning bramble Abimelech in a very definite way. And so notice verse 47, it was told Abimelech that all the men of the Tower of Shechem were gathered together. And Abimelech got him up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people that were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand, cut down a bough from the trees and took it and laid it on his shoulder and said unto the people that were with him, what you have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. And all the people likewise cut down every man his bow, followed Abimelech, and put them to the hold, and set the hold on fire upon them, so that all the men of the tower of Shechem died also, about a thousand men and women. And so, tremendous devastation. Um, certainly the prophecy is being fulfilled. Thousand men and women were either suffocated in the fumes or incinerated in the tower but El Bereth, or Baal Bereth, was powerless to save them. Because, again, he was just an idol. He was a god that cannot see. He couldn't provide protection for those that put their trust in him. And so even a secure tower couldn't protect them. Yet there's more, a more secure tower that had been available to them if they had have availed of it. And I'm thinking of the many references in Scripture to the Lord being our secure tower. Why don't you just look at a few references just for a second. Book of Proverbs, book of Proverbs, and chapter 18, and verse 10. Proverbs 18, verse 10, where we read this. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous runneth into it and is safe. They went into a tower, but it was the tower connected with this false god, Baal. And yet the tragedy is they should have turned to the name of the Lord as a strong tower and run to him and found safety in him and his name. Look at the book of Psalms, Psalm 61. Psalm 61 and verse 3. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. This is a Psalm of David. And he acknowledges, although great hostility was, was against him, but he, he will acknowledge and testify that God had been a shelter for him and a strong tower from the enemy. And even we know from the word of God that even when the fire does come, we think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 24 and 25, that even in the midst of the fire, the Lord was with them in the fire. And how appropriate, just one other verse I want to read from Isaiah in connection with this, that the Lord is that strong tower. Isaiah 43 just beautiful words in verse two. It says, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. 
And so again, just what a reminder that uh, tragically they put their confidence in men and in false gods, and they were of no help to them. And yet all the while, these were the people of God, and they had a glorious opportunity to go to the secure safety of the name of the Lord, which is a strong tower. But they chose not to, and they paid a high price for their rebellion against God. So verse 50, Abimelech is still not done. Uh, again, this, this burning bramble is just uh, hot with heat and determined to cause more devastation. And so we read in verse 50, then went Abimelech to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and took it. So he goes now approximately 10 miles, 16 kilometers to the north of Shechem, and he camped against a place called Thebes, and he took it. Now, clearly, he suspected the inhabitants of also having been involved in the rebellion against him. Therefore, they, in his mind, had to be punished. But notice 50, verse 51, but there was a strong tower within the city, and thither fled all the men and women and all they of the city and shut it to them and get them up to the top of the tower. So once again, they run to a tower for shelter in the city of Thebes. And again, this time it doesn't just say the men, it emphasizes the men and women, because a woman is going to have a key role in the demise of this man, Abimelech. So men and women have gone into this tower for protection. Verse 52, Abimelech came onto the tower and fought against it and went hard to the door of the tower to burn it with fire. So again, same tactics. He's going to uh, burn the people out again. But this time he would fail to incinerate or smoke out the people of the tower. And perhaps it would imply that they were not involved in the death of Gideon's family. And the reason I say that is if you look at verse 56 and verse 57, now we're just moving ahead a bit here, but we're getting the divine explanation of what has taken place in verse 56 and verse 57. It says, Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father in slaying his 70 brethren, and all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. And so again, it was the men of Shechem that were complicit with Abimelech in killing Gideon's 70 sons. And therefore, they, uh, God visited upon them, in a sense, what they sowed, they also reaped. He visited judgment. God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech and all the evil of the men of Shechem. But there's no mention here of Thebes. Thebes clearly wasn't involved. It wasn't involved in this, uh, the, the uh, complicit in the slaughter of the, uh, the, the sons of Gideon. And again, it would say to us this, that God is righteous even in his judgments. And what we would say is this, uh, shall not the God of all the earth do right, in the words of Abraham in Genesis 18, verse 25. And so God limited divine judgment to those who were deserving of it. And those who had not been uh, complicit in the death of Gideon's sons were not to perish in the same means. Notice verse 53, a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. Clearly, in his rage, he became careless. And it's true that when we're getting a rage, um, a fleshly rage, you don't think clearly. You don't, you don't rationalize well. Uh, you, you act very impulsively, but not very rationally. And so he, here's a man, he's in a rage. He's, a, he's out to destroy everybody that dared to challenge him in his mind, whether they did or not, he's out to destroy them. And so he became careless and he came too near to the tower and a certain woman cast this piece of millstone upon Abimelech's head to break his skull. 
And the word millstone suggests that it was an upper millstone. Remember, they had two stones that ground together and to, to grind the bread. And this was an upper millstone, and it was between one and two feet, usually, uh, in, uh, in size uh, and um, in diameter, 30 to 60 centimeters, and two to four inches, or five to 10 centimeters thick. So it was quite a hefty piece of, of rock that she threw down. And justice was done. The man who had slain his brethren upon one stone was himself crushed by one stone, the upper millstone. <laughs> and it's just interesting, isn't it? What a man sows, that shall he also reap. And you see that the accuracy of it all, uh, the word of God. Talk about having a splitting headache. <laughs> this man had a splitting headache that day. Everything that, that really had happened had stemmed from wrong thoughts coming from this man's mind. Because all sin really begins in the mind, doesn't it? As a man thinketh, so is he. And so because of his failure uh, in New Testament language to live out the reality of Romans 12 in verse 3, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And so what we can say is that here's the tragedy, that out of this man's mind, all this evil that had occurred came because he thought of himself more highly than he ought to think. And so the very instrument that was the cause of all this trouble suffered a crushing blow from a woman. And of course, it's just amazing. He was the son of Jeroboam, but he had embarked on the trail of destruction by appealing to his mother's brethren. If you remember back in verse one, again, I realize this, we said this is the longest chapter in the book of Judges. So we've covered a lot of ground here, but it says Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, speak, I pray, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it's better for you, either that all the sons of Jeroboam, which are three score and ten persons reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And so he appealed to his mother's brethren, and it's fitting that his journey should end at the hands of a woman. <laughs> the head that had worn the crown ultimately was crushed. And this unnamed woman of Thebes, because we have no idea what her name is, she joins Deborah, she joins Jael as women God used to overcome seemingly invincible warriors. And isn't it wonderful how God does this? And verse 54, when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. Once their leader was dead, they all went home. They were done. The many of Israel that had supported him against Shechem departed every man to his place. Thus, Jotham's prophecy had been filled, been fulfilled. Let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. The bramble that had lusted after being promoted over the trees departed as violently as he had appeared on the scene. And again, the Lord says, those that live by the sword, as it were, perish by the sword. Verse 56, God rendered the wickedness. And, and so this is, this is what happens. Now notice verse 54 as well. I want you to see there. He called hastily to the young man, his armor bearer, and said unto him, draw thy sword, draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slew him. And his young man thrust him through and he died. And of course, there was always a shame to be killed in battle, but the greatest shame, because they didn't suffer from gender 
issues in those days. They understood men were men and women were women, and they had different roles and responsibilities, and they weren't confused like our society about matters. And it was considered to be a great shame to die at the hands of a woman. And so he's desperate not to have this reputation. And so he calls his armor bearer and he says, kill me with the sword. The armor bearer in this case obliged and did it. And so Abimelech came to an undignified an inglorious end, fractured skull from a woman, and then the armor bearer's sword finishes off the, the damage. Now, notice as well, though, that getting his armor bearer to do this didn't work. He, he didn't want the reputation of dying at the hands of a woman. But look at 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel in verse Chapter 11 and verse 21. It says in verse 21, it says, Who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerobesheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why went ye nigh the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. And so even years later, despite his attempt to cover up the humiliation of a woman uh, being responsible really for his demise, he wasn't able to silence the rumors of how he had died. It continued many years later. And so verse 55, it says, and when the men of Israel saw Abimelech was dead, they all went to their own place. Of course, um, they saw that it was all over for him. Thus, verse 56. Now, this is, this is the divine explanation of all the things that are going on. It says, thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father in slaying his 70 brethren, and all the evil men of Shechem did God render upon their heads and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. So <clears throat> what we see here is we can be certain that God will repay wickedness, either in this life or in the life to come. And often God finds a way to do it both in this life and in the life to come. His justice and his holiness Demand this. And that's exactly what we're told is the, behind all the scenes. Even though he's been thrust out, God is still at work. And he is working in a marvelous way. It was a time when evil men appeared to be running rampant during this stage of Israel's history. But God was in control and working behind the scenes throughout as the sovereign God, he entered into the affairs of men by sending this, this evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. But that did not absolve them from responsibility from their own actions. Each of the protagonists brought about his own destruction and reaped what he had sown. And again, we would say the practical application is this, that rule amongst God's people, it must be a rule of love, not a rule of ambition. It must be out of love for the saints and love for the Savior. Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Feed my sheep, care for my flock. And again, just to, to remind ourselves from the words of Galatians, he says, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one another. This I say then, Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, cause one of the tragedies of this whole chapter is that these people had had a warning from Jotham. His parable was a warning, a, a God-given warning. God spoke through Jotham, this first parable in scripture, and warned them, this will be the consequences of your actions. And they failed to listen and heed the warning from God. And they paid a very heavy 
price. God has warned us in scripture over and over again about the folly of selfish ambition, of life dominated by the flesh. And we better take heed because the results of ignoring God's warnings are absolutely a catastrophe for the people of God. And then we would just say, finally, the coming man of sin will exhibit all the characteristics of Abimelech. He's Satan's man. And just like Satan, I will be like the Most High God. He'll be filled with selfish ambition. And he'll be cruel because he'll be controlled by the adversary. And he will reap a harvest of chaos on the earth. Just like we see in this chapter. It's a warning chapter. It's a long chapter. It's a very important chapter and one we should really take heed to. Abimelech, seek great things for thyself, seek them not. Let's just commit the Lord's, uh, these thoughts to the Lord that it might be a blessing and an encouragement to all of us. Amen.